Welcome to Data Talks with BioLizard, a podcast series diving deeper into the world of data science, bioinformatics, big data analysis, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Hosted by BioLizard, an expert consultancy company specializing in all things data. Hello listeners, I am your host, Catherine Morrissey, and today we will be kicking off this series by talking to a group of our own women scientists to discuss women in science, share their personal experiences, and explore the future of data science. The purpose of today's podcast is to firstly discuss the current landscape of data science, artificial intelligence, and bioinformatics in pharma and biotech, specifically from a woman's perspective. And then secondly, to kind of explore each of your personal career journeys and that discuss or what the future of women in bioinformatics looks like. So just introduce yourself, explain what, what drew you to science and how you ended up working for BioLizard in your respective roles and just explain a little bit of your background and how you kind of got to the point of where you are. Okay. Hello, I'm Lisbeth Seele. I'm currently CEO of BioLizard. Um, I'm a vet. Uh, I'm a vet by training, so I was very triggered by science from the start, from my, uh, yeah, during my younger years already. And after veterinary medicine, I, I did a PhD in veterinary sciences, and then I moved to um, the pharma world, so pharma environment, which I really liked. Um, and afterwards, I moved more to the service side, where I did different roles, always related to science, although I evolved them more to a manager role, but I did project management, quality management, always related to scientific topics. And since two and a half years, I'm um, working at BioLizard, uh, which is very interesting, of course, um, because these days data is so important. And today I'm mainly managing the company, but I'm still like a lot of the scientific aspects of what we're doing as well. I'm Sandra, uh, and I'm actually a bioengineer from Ghent University. Um, during my studies as bioengineer, I got hooked to biotechnology and bioinformatics in, in general. So I did a PhD in bioinformatics and epigenetics uh, also at Ghent University in the Biobix uh, lab uh, with Wim van Kriekingen, who is uh, one of the founders of uh, BioLizard. After my PhD, I uh, went to the US uh, to work in a diagnostic company that developed um, tests for uh, bladder cancer and prostate cancer. I'm now currently working in a healthcare company uh, in California too, in the AI uh, department, focusing heavily on digital mobile clinical trials and specifically the use of AI tools in these uh, mobile trials. And uh, starting in May, actually, I'm also going to start a, a research uh, position at Stanford University. So hi, I'm Eva Balini. Uh, I come from Greece. I've been working in BioLizard since October 2021. Initially, well, I was not really one of those people who really knew what they wanted to do from the start, from, from being a child. I changed a lot of career options in my mind. And, um, well, it's a bit too complicated to uh, explain the Greek educational system. But uh, from wanting to become a biologist, I suddenly... Uh, ended up in uh, the University of Thessaly in Greece. Uh, I studied computer science and biomedical informatics. It was more computer science focused. This actually got me very interest, uh, interested in engineering and in uh, computer science as well. So once I finished, I moved to Belgium to work. Uh, I was hoping to work on bioinformatics more, uh, but I ended up working as a software developer. I did two years of that and I decided I didn't want to pursue that anymore. So I did the master in AI here in uh, Belgium at uh, KU Leuven. And after that, I was looking for another job. I rang uh, by Lizard's Pell and this is pretty much how I ended up here. Okay, so then I'm Lara de Knop. I started working at BioLizard as an intern last May. So... After that, I continued working there as a junior bioinformatician, and BioLizards is actually my first employer. 
Uh, I think the fascination with science for me started already when I was quite young. I was always intrigued, um, especially with mathematics. And then at the end of high school, I got in touch with genetics. And I, at that point, I really knew that that was what I wanted to do uh, in my career. So I started studying as a bioengineer and during this education and also later in uh, business school, it became more and more clear to me that there is a lot to discover and a lot to, to offer in the bioinformatics field. That's why I wanted to be part of it. Okay, cool. So it's very different, diverse ways of getting to come to BioLizard. So maybe we can explain a little bit about BioLizard aims to do. Um, BioLizard aims to answer challenging scientific questions in the pharma and biotech industries. Why is there such a need for this type of company? Yes, I think most of, of the people know already that lately there are, a lot, there are a lot of new technologies constantly evolving, which means that much more data can be generated and not just the amount of data is increasing, but also the complexity. So, um, and of course, you need also people who can handle all those complex data. And it's not just one bioinformatics scientist anymore who can handle all the data. So we need much more different profile types like computer science experts, but also IT people, some more software people, next to them uh, highly skilled bioinformatics people. And it's difficult for companies to have all those different profiles in-house. And that is why BioLizard really can help because we have that broad skill set uh, people with various different backgrounds, and then we can really solve complex questions from, from the client. That's, that's probably the main reason. Does anyone have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I, I think Lisbeth phrased it very well, um, given the, the current um, increase in, in data and technologies. Um, it's very hard to, for companies to have everything in-house like experience wise but also um skill wise and and i think that's where biologist is is, is uh, coming in and and de delivering yeah having different profiles of people with with expertise in different fields that can uh, work together uh, to tackle these and indeed maybe to add it's it's also important to be up to date about innovation what is going on what will be the next um important tool to be used and we really are on top of that and it's not easy for each company to know what is going on. So that's also an important aspect to add. Sandra, you've been with BioLizard since its inception. Can you elaborate a little bit on the early days of BioLizard? What was it like? Yeah, yeah, sure. We we actually started off with, with a small group of group of people, like four or five. And most people actually um, came from academia, uh, where things are a bit different than in industry. So we need to make like some kind of switch uh, in the beginning, different mindset. For example, staying focused on the main question of the customer is key and, and not getting lost in, in, in like the weeds of sideline questions because things as customer experience and, and communication become very important. Also time management, streamlining, reproducibility, especially detailed documentation are yeah, major in, in companies. But I think we, we managed to, to tackle this um, steep learning curve quite well. Uh, we also needed to because the project kept coming in. Uh, so, and our team grew faster than expected. And, and especially since Lisbeth also joined, things really took off for BioLizard. Yeah. Why do you think bioinformatics is important in general? And more specifically, why do you think having women working in that space is very important? Yeah, yeah. Um, because the field of medicine and healthcare has progressed so much in the last years and the accumulation of, of biological data sets or other data sets have created a situation where like healthcare providers are responsible for synthesizing, aggregating uh, and interpreting all these data that's actually far beyond human capacity. I think we as bioinformaticians have like unique, unique skill set covering biology, machine learning, statistics to support uh, and progress these efforts and making sense of the data, basically. And having women is important to, to break the stigma that engineering, AI and, and statistics is something that only men are interested in. On the other hand, I personally think that it's, it's not important to strive for an equal representation of an equal in our field, uh, men and women, um, but that we simply make sure that 
there is no discrimination between either one. We should simply aim to hire the right person for the right job, and people are the most productive and creative when, when they find the job that fits them the most. Yeah, true. I guess that um, having female bioinformaticians sitting in front of us or in this discussion is evidence that you know it's not just a male-dominated sphere. So. Laura, what would you say is probably the most common myth or misunderstanding when people hear the word bioinformatics or computer science or hear that you are, you know, a bioinformatician? Uh, I think there are two things, or at least for me, there are two things. Uh, first is about people that work in IT in general, I think. Uh, a lot of people think that we are very nerdy, that we don't like to communicate and come outside of our houses, that we are not so social. Uh, but that's not true at all. I think Violet is, is a very nice group of people and we do have afterworks, which are quite nice. And I think the second one is about the work itself. Uh, a lot of my friends, they think that I'm programming all the time, which is, of course, not true at all. Uh, there is also a big part of our job that is the biological um, explanation of the outcomes of uh, the algorithms. Uh, we do need to talk to clients a lot. So I think... The, the largest part of my job is giving presentations and explaining uh, stuff. Yeah, I think when, when you exist in that kind of interdisciplinary group of science, it's hard to kind of explain to people, especially, you know, novices in the field or people who have no experience about what bioinformatics is, um, what you actually do. And yeah, it, it, it does take some time because obviously people think of certain things in boxes and you're trying to break down those boxes, obviously with scientific communication and podcasts and basically what my role is in BioLizard is to, you know, showcase what BioLizard does to the average person. And it, it can be a challenge at times. And there's a lot of misunderstandings and myths and ideas of what we do. Um, but I think we're making good headway in trying to resolve those, those issues. So maybe you can hear from Eva, how is it being a woman in science and specifically computer science? Tell us a little bit about you know, your journey of getting to, I mean, you said you didn't really want to do science or not want to do science, but it wasn't on your radar in the beginning. Maybe explain a little bit more about that journey. Yeah, th that's true because uh, uh, when I was a little child, I wanted to become a teacher. Then uh, growing up as a teenager, I wanted to do psychology. And um, yeah, and I finally ended up being a bioinformatician. As I said, I wanted to be a biologist before, so I found that balance in my degrees. So to be honest, it's kind of a roller coaster this journey because I started from a university that uh, where women in science were very very well represented, um, from students, teachers, PhD students as well. I could see a lot of women around me and I didn't know there was a problem, honestly. And I only realized it, I realized it a bit when I had uh, some summer schools. One was in digital health and um, we had to form teams and I was the only woman in my team. And we were only maybe 10 women in total out of 50 or 60 people. And um, then it got a bit worse when I started looking for a job because I was getting a lot of rejections or sometimes interviews, especially with men, were a bit weird and hard. Uh, so, yeah, job hunting was very challenging for me. It wasn't, um, I wasn't working in biotech from day one. I started as a software developer, as I said. So I have more to say on that field, first of all. I've worked in offices where I was the only woman in the floor, for example, um, well, I had the tons of mansplaining, and I guess you have received some too. Um, I've heard phrases like, wow, you can code from men when it was my actual job to do it. Um, and I think very often uh, it still happens a bit, but now less. I only realize actually that we don't have credibility as women sometimes. And this is something I experienced a lot in my journey. And I mean that... Uh, very often when I say something, it has to be proven or my knowledge is not taken very seriously. It, it gets questioned, uh, even though it's correct. So it's, yeah, as I said, it's a very big roller coaster. Uh, but on the other hand, especially the last years, I see more women in the field. 
I see also more women uh, scientists uh, being represented on social media, women in, you know, higher in the corporate ladder and women as managers and as CEOs, as Lisbeth uh, is, for example. And this gave me a lot of courage. Uh, I met also a lot of women that were in STEM and uh, in biotech specifically. And I discovered I was not alone in this journey. Uh, I got a lot of hope. Um, and these last months, especially in BioLizard, I realized a bit more my value. So I'm very glad now that I'm working in a very rewarding and uh, positive environment. That's, that's good to hear. I don't know, maybe Sandra, if you've had a similar experience, you moved from Belgium, which was kind of seen as a biotech hub to California, which is also another biotech hub, or might have a different experience than ever. Yeah, it, it was a bit different. I also was like the uh, often the only uh, uh, female on, on the work floor, but I honestly never had any bad experience so far um, with that. But yeah, things are, are, I think, not so different between Belgium and, and uh, US on that front. So do you have any advice for someone starting out in your career? Yeah, yeah. My biggest advice, it's also advice I would give myself, uh, my, my younger self, is, is don't try to like know everything uh, or, or focus on, on one specific thing, but rather aim to have like a, a broad scientific uh, background to build on, which allows to easily pick up and learn new, more advanced things uh, when you actually need them. And you can never like be perfect in everything and know all the tools and techniques and and. And um, because things are moving so fast and, it, and it's hard to keep up uh, with every detail. So, yeah, uh, my advice would be like, uh, make sure you cover the bases, follow how things are, are moving and progressing and know where to find the right resources uh, and go deeper uh, when necessary. Yeah. yeah, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but as, as women, we feel like we have to establish our place in our chosen field and so we try to take on everything and do everything and know everything but no human can actually do that yeah. so you know relying on your team and allowing yourself to learn and to not be perfect is probably one yeah. of the best you know advices that you can get given. exactly yeah 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 and i think it's also that thing that i mentioned before about credibility that um, even if you know stuff, you get questioned, but that makes you feel even worse when you don't know something. And even if others think that it's okay not to know it, you have this internal um, fear that everybody will judge you. Yeah, does anyone else have any other advice to someone starting in, you know, in your chosen career? Well, I can give some advice as well, um, and it's maybe also more general advice. But what I, if I look back to myself and my career, I learned that patience, it's really a very good thing to have. Be patient. Don't think or don't want to go too fast. And definitely when you're young, learn as much as possible. Try out different stuff. And then in the end, everything will go well and, and you will know exactly what you like, what you don't like. Uh, be passionate by, about your job. That's also something that for me, it's, it's very uh, important. Be happy about what you do as well. And I have one motto and I try to, try to follow it myself as well. I always say, don't regret what you did. Do regret what you didn't do. So that is also my advice. That is, that is very good advice. Maybe I'll direct the next question to you, Liz, that um, you're a very busy woman, <laughs> CEO of a company, juggling multiple titles. You're also the director of Healthcare Business Women's Association, yeah, as well as being a mother. So maybe you can explain, you know, what is your, what is your morning routine look like? What is, what is an average day in the life of Liz? Mm -hmm. So I try to get up between 6 and 6.30 and I go to the gym, even if it's only for 30 minutes, but I really like to have some sports exercises because, yeah, our job, it's sitting a lot each day. So I really want to have a combination of moving and, and sitting. And then when I come home, it's uh, a lot of noise and a lot of 
hectic things with the kids. So then it's always, it's another job next to Baila, so actually are raising the kids. But then it's cleaning up the house, taking a shower, and then it's 8.30, ready to start my my job. That's on average a morning. Uh, so actually already very busy, but I'm always happy that I did the exercise in the morning. Um, otherwise I regret during the day. <laughs> Uh, does anyone else have any specific routines that they follow or potentially a productivity hack, something that gets you motivated to start your day and you know, stay on top of the multiple things that you have to do in a day? Yeah, for me, it's actually very similar uh, to this batch. Um, also, I try to do exercise in the morning uh, first thing. Because otherwise, other things come along and you never, you never, never do it. And and for me, it's it's a great way to to wake up, but also uh, to be more productive during the day. Yeah, that and my noise canceling headphones. Yeah. <laughs> Eva, do you have any morning routines that you like to stick to? Um, not specifically because I don't have so many things to tackle with yet. Uh, maybe on the productivity hack that you mentioned, um, well, it's not really a, a hack. I would say it's like a trick or a mindset switch. It's uh, for the times that I feel like I'm in a rut or I'm stuck or something. Um, and uh, I feel like I cannot move forward, even if it's something at work or anything else. Um, I read that in a book, it says, action becomes before motivation so sometimes you start doing and then motivation will come forward thus productivity as well so i try to to do that and also i'm a big fan of to-do lists i think being organized especially when you work in a lot of projects at the same time and also you have to you know do the groceries and you you have a house to clean and everything i always keep two to-do lists one for work and one for my personal life and um, when I wake up in the morning I see what's in my backlog and I decide what I want to do or I decide the more the night before yeah I also I'm also a fan of to-do lists I have generally and I color code them so I have a, a ongoing to-do list and I actually color code okay this is what's going to be tackled this week and this is what's going to be tackled next week because then I have to prioritize what can be shifted to the next week what needs to be like top priority today, tomorrow. Um, so I normally start my Monday mornings, you know, cup of coffee, to-do list, admin emails. And Laura, do you have anything to add? Yes, I, I already heard the two uh, most important things that I wanted to say. I'm also a big fan of to-do lists uh, and I like to work in silence. So whenever I need to be productive, I love the plugin Earplugs. Maybe we can move on to Sandra. Your experience moving from Belgium to the USA and settling there, what are the, the most important lessons you've learned both professionally and personally? It's a quite a different culture. Yeah, great question. And and that's a different culture. You, yeah, that's actually uh, the main thing I'm going to talk about. So um, yeah, I'm at four years in the US so far. I, I think I learned more than than. I did during the last 10 years in, in Belgium, both professionally, uh, but also personally. So I can, I can actually really recommend to, to anyone to come out of their comfort zone and, 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 and see what it's like out there, uh, even if it's for a short while, not only US, but just for Belgium, go out of Belgium for a year. Or not only did I like learn a lot about other cultures and, and perspectives, but also about myself, how I behave and act, uh, what I value most and, and feel is, is important to me. There's just, there's actually a lot of stuff that you unknowingly take for granted, but you only real, realize this when you move to another place with different cultural norms and, and backgrounds. And I start to appreciate and value specific things from Belgium a lot more actually. And I, I really learned to put things uh, in, into perspective. Professionally, like things move very fast here and there's a lot of competition, which is tough, but it's also exciting in a way. Because you always need to push yourself, uh, be on top of your game. Um, you learn a lot. You need to learn a lot to learn fast. And, and because of that, because things are moving very fast, things are very unpredictable. And I was, I was a person who really like had a long-term view and then worked towards uh, long-term goals. But I actually learned to live more in the moment. And then because life really rarely goes as planned, which I think is, is a good thing, actually. You have to be flexible and then 
take things as they come and important never be afraid to ask for help uh, if things get hard uh, yeah yeah i think how boring would life be if it all went to plan <laughs> um yeah i i definitely experienced a similar thing when i moved to belgium even though belgium is you would think belgium south africa is about a big shift in mindsets um i found it quite difficult because a lot of Belgians are quite reserved compared to South Africans and so yeah I can imagine the the converse of that going from Belgium to America because that culture is also very very different. Eva maybe you would like to share your experience of um, you know coming from Greece to Belgium and what you learned um, in a professional and personal capacity. Yeah. So yeah, for me, it was also a big change. Uh, I also did one month in Switzerland, in Geneva, before I came to Belgium, because I had a training there. And uh, I was also quite uh, shocked. I had a culture shock, let's say. Um, but in the end, uh, I realized that we are more alike as humans than we are different. And I think this is the most important part. And then in general, all of my, um, I think the biggest lesson that I learned was about people, that you need to surround yourself with the correct people. And throughout this journey, I really, you know, filtered a lot of relationships because when you make a decision like that, and especially for me that I did it in 10 days, I took a decision to move to Belgium. It's very common for people to, you know, to have people who judge you, who will criticize you, some will be jealous, some will pity you, for example, some will support you. So it's really important to have people around you that support you no matter what. And they will always be there for you, even if it's physically like next to you, or if it's, you know, your friends in your home country that you can always call through Skype, for example. And I think it's very similar in the professional world. I think this whole experience made me realize in what environments I want to be professionally as well, because I also like to be uh, in a, you know, in a work environment that I have inspiring people around me and people who support me and that will um, push me to the correct direction and uh, support my journey. So I think it's all about people and relationships. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Maybe I'll, um, push it to Lisbeth and ask, you know, in your opinion, bring it back a little bit to bioinformatics or at least in the biotech industry, what is the most important personality trait or strength that someone would need in order to work in the biotech industry and be successful? Yes, I think it's a difficult question. It's it's not an easy one, but if I definitely when I look to women, um, and it may sound cliche, but I think it's true you should be authentic. It's also a softer environment and world or sector compared to other sectors. So um, if I look to myself and to my colleagues, I think, uh, of course, the scientific knowledge, it's crucial, understanding the, the clients very well from a scientific perspective, but then being able to listen very well, understand being empathic, that, that's very important in our sector. Um, so rather than just um, be superficial or, or whatever, going really into depth, for, for me, that's, that's, I think, an important aspect or characteristic to have. So Laura, what's the biggest challenge that you're facing in your current role or a specific project right now? Um, and what kind of steps are you taking to tackle that problem? Well, I think for me, uh, in general, um, I'm working as a junior. It's my first role. So everything that, that is assigned to me is completely new. I have to learn a lot. And I, I do think that's challenging. And I, I do like to learn a lot. But sometimes I'm a bit not so confident with that. So I have to learn how to deal with it. And I do that with uh, talking to a lot of people and, and always try to ask as many questions as possible. I do think BioLizard is a great company for self-development as they give us a lot of opportunities to uh, improve ourselves. So yeah, I think that's the biggest challenge for me right now. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, starting out is always probably the most difficult 
Um, that first job out of academia seems to be the most defining year with learning different skills, both personally and professionally. Maybe we can go a little bit into the, the nitty gritty and ask Eva, what are some of the tools and skills that are indispensable for your job? And then maybe Sandra can also add to, to that. After Eva. Yeah, um, so I will not mention anything about IDEs or any anything, um, any way of working on the computer and everything because everyone has their own uh, preferences. So even if I say something, it will be completely different for someone else. If we exclude the sound isolation headphones, uh, noise cancelling headphones that they mentioned earlier, I totally agree. And uh, well, blue, uh, blue light filtering glasses and coffee. <laughs> I would say pen and paper uh, or a whiteboard or post-its because I'm a very visual person and it's much better for me to, and much easier actually for me to solve a problem when I visualize it. So I have like here in my, um, in my notepad, I have a lot of, you know, doodling, but this really helps me solve a problem. And now that everything is digital, I really need that contact, you know, with pen and paper uh, to feel like I'm doing something, uh, you know, something physical. Um, and then for skills, I would definitely mention organization again. Um, maybe it's again something personal because this is how I am and this is how I like to work. Something that maybe it's not, maybe it is underrated in our era is relaxing and taking a step back because I really believe that your mind can give you the answers when you're relaxing and when you're not thinking about the problem. So I think it's very important to know when you have to take a step back and uh, let yourself, you know, your unconscious self do the magic for you. Yeah, I definitely agree with uh, the coffee <laughs> and um, also the relaxing part, actually. I also sometimes get lost in my computer, whereas it's sometimes more, it's better to step out of your office, go for a walk, come back and try to focus again. Uh, I had to learn that myself and I, I, it really, really helps. And, and skill-wise, I think it's, it's important in our job to, to easily pick up new things. Customers ask different things. Uh, also, if it's out of your field, just have the, the skill to, to read about it uh learn about it and and yeah and pick it up uh, yeah. if you could go back to your 18 year old self and, and give yourself some advice based on where you are now what would it be uh i think it would be uh it doesn't matter what you choose to do everything will be okay and you will find your path and your way into a, a job you like i didn't study bioinformatics uh, and i ended up here so i think uh, everything is possible if you're like to do it yeah, I totally agree. And my first uh, year of university self wouldn't believe that I work in a bioinformatics company now, I think. My advice would be something very cliche, and this is to believe in yourself, because it's only until we get old, especially for us women, that we realize our worth and our capabilities. So the earlier you realize your worth and what you can do, the more you can achieve and the more you can strive in life. Thanks. That's really great advice. Maybe just to wrap up, I've got four questions left. First one is to you, Lisbeth. What is the biggest challenge women in science are facing right now? And what can we do to tackle that? Yes, I must admit that specifically in science, when I look to Belgium, that we still quite, or we get quite some chances. So I don't see... At least when I look at my career and the chances and opportunities that I got, that I didn't have too much challenges. But in general, as a woman, what a challenge is for me is still being confident in what I do. And I think it's maybe some, I hear it from other women too, being confident, believing what you do. Um, and now I'm over 40 and I'm still sometimes doubting about what I'm doing. Do I, am I, am I the right person for this? 
So um, I think as a woman, we just have to be much more confident and like a man often go out and say, yes, I can, we can, without any doubt. And an advice that I would give is like um, what I'm doing as well as I, I took a coach and it really helps coach getting coached. And when some doubts arise, then I have that coach to say, yeah, Liz, but you can, don't worry. So that, that's the way I would tackle it and, and, and yeah, learn to work on the self-development. Uh, but I guess that is a bit of a human nature to doubt mm-hmm. yourself. And yeah, wouldn't it be wonderful that in 50 years, women don't have this feeling of insignificance? So I don't know if anyone has anything else to add to that specifically. If not, I'd maybe move on to Sandra and just ask, what does the, the future of computational biology look like? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I think computational biology is, is likely to become... Uh, a part of, of uh, routine healthcare in the future. And next to research and drug discovery, I think applications will be incorporated in Italy medical research for clinical use, which is actually already happening now. And I think this will transform the field of healthcare from a symptom-based diagnosis and treatment to precision medicine, where, where patients are treated based on their, their individual characteristics. Secondly, I think Currently, there's like still a bit of a wall between computational scientists and, and bench researchers. I think in the future, this line will blur and then I think ultimately dissolve uh, because these days you need to know both sides. You need to know what's happening in the lab. You need to know what's happening in the dry lab, both for successful experiments, experimental setup, but also for the correct analysis and, and interpretation. And I think, yeah, in the future, we need to do both uh, or, or we need to be skilled in both and understand what's happening at both sides. This leads nicely on to the next question about where will BioLizard be in the next five years? What, what's what's BioLizard's role in the future of computational biology? Mm-hmm. Yeah, our ambition is definitely to become the go-to data science company globally. So now we're already working mainly in Europe and the US. So we really want to expand our business in a global way. So when people have a data problem, they should think about BioLizard within one second. So it, it should be a reflex. Um, and then, of course, growing meaning means also having more locations. So we really want to have an additional lo- uh, location, for example, in the US, but maybe also in another European country. So that's hopefully something that we can achieve in in five years. And then, of course, um, increase the team, the number of people. So when I started in 2019, as Sandra mentioned, we were with four or five people, now almost 30. So why not being ambitious and say that we we will be with more than 100 people in a few years. So um, that's really our ambition, that we can help support biotech and pharma companies across the globe. Okay, great. Um, So, well, that's the end of the questions I have. The last thing uh, is maybe if there is a question you wish I had asked um, and or if you have questions for each other and would like to ask each other questions. Yeah, um, so maybe one question I didn't ask is, if you wake up in the morning and, and you lost all your bioinformatics skills, what would your backup career be? <laughs> For me, uh, I think uh, I would be a barista, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't have too many bioinformatics skills, but if I would lose them, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, open a bed and breakfast. Similarly to Sandra, I would become a chef or a cook. Yeah, I'm also on the same side as Eva. I love to cook, so it would be really nice uh, maybe to sell cakes uh, or something. I would love to do that. And we can set up a partnership. Huh? Yeah, I think so. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, thank you all for coming and giving an hour of your time to talk about you know, women in science and biolizard. Well, everyone have a good evening. Uh, Sandra, have a good day. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.